Next, we talk about the principles of crisis resource management. <coughs> so from your perspective, when or why do crises happen in healthcare? Why do they occur? Yep, teamwork. Mm -hmm. Yep, so maybe if they're working individually, maybe they're not communicating very well. We know that communication is a huge problem mm -hmm. in healthcare and the leading factor in why we have crises. Any other reasons? Leadership yeah. issues. Leadership. Leadership. We find that if we don't clearly identify okay, I'm too negative, I'm too negative, then so if there's no clear delineation there, it can often be breakdown of communication right. and then poor performance as a team and stuff like that. Exactly. Any other thoughts? Skill set. Skill set. Definitely. Yeah. And it's about expectations, right? You expect someone to be somewhere, maybe they're here or there, and so the expectations don't align with your thoughts as an instructor, maybe even. Yeah. Any other thoughts? We tend to see crises happen because we're trying to perform multiple tasks simultaneously under increased time pressure. So those three things, you've got multiple tasks having to be done simultaneously, and you have that time pressure component. But you can separate it even further. You can separate it into situational issues and human, human factors issues. So situational issues would be um, dynamic issues, such as rapid changes in the patient or time pressure, you know, you have to get something done in a very short amount of time. You have uh, complex issues, so that would be complex patients. So we know that patients are quite sick, uh, they're coming in with comorbidities, um, and they're sicker than they have ever been. Um, and there's complexities with staffing as well. So we've got agency workers, we've got locum physicians coming in, so every time you have a team come together for a crisis, it's usually a different team, right? So you've got complexities in the skill set and the experience and the team that is coming together. Um, you have hazardous issues, situational issues, which would include equipment failures. So equipment failures also includes not knowing how to use your equipment. So you could have a, a failure in the, that the equipment doesn't work properly, but it's also a failure if you don't know how to use it. You have human factors issues that correspond with crises as well. So that's kind of what I just spoke about. When you have a crisis, you're trying to perform complex and routine decision making and skills at the same time. And you're under increased time pressure. So all of those things are kind of moving parts, so to speak. Um, because the routine things are quite easy, but then you're trying to think ahead, you know, two, three, four steps down the road, and you've got that complexity going on in your mind as well um, that really adds to the, to the chaos that a crisis already has. Um, you've also got distractions and stress as humans. So luckily our brains filter out quite a bit. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't filter out all these distractions, right? And those can be really um, impairing in helping us solve crises. The stress level as well. So a little bit of stress is great. A lot of stress really hinders our ability to act during a crisis. You also have the issue of um, observations and decision making. So preconceived ideas or pre-compiled responses, what we say in simulation, is having an experience in your head and utilizing that to help you drive forward. So that's what simulation is all about, helping you um, have that context, that experience, so that if you experience it in real life, you have that ability to draw back on, oh, I've done this before, I know what to do. Uh, it's that cognitive um, ability and also that technical and, and skill ability to to basically drive through um, the action uh, because you've already had that experience. If you go into a situation if you've never seen it before, you may have some trouble understanding what the clinical diagnosis is or you may have some trouble knowing what the steps two, three, and four are and what um, help you might need because you've never experienced it before. And so that's really a great component of simulation to help you through that. Um, just 
talking about human performance briefly, despite having that cognitive and technical knowledge and expertise, healthcare providers and professionals don't always manage crises appropriately. And it gets back to the fact that we are humans, we have air, but we don't train appropriately for it. It's, um, it's a bit hard because in our culture, in our healthcare culture, mistakes happen, but we have somewhat of a blame culture. It's part of that mentality that we have to do everything right, we have to be everything. Um, and so it's hard to accept blame, it's hard to accept mistakes, and that ties into crises um, and the culture that doesn't let us get past um, admitting mistakes and, and recognizing errors. And that's hopefully what simulation helps with. Crisis resource management defined is a management system which makes use of all available resources, so people, procedures, equipment, to promote safety and enhance efficiency during a crisis situation. So crisis resource management actually has its birthplace in aviation and aerospace. So both of those industries are high stakes industries like medicine. So in the 1970s, they developed crew resource management and they utilize simulation um, basically as a way to overlearn skills. So they try to become overprepared. We're not at that standard in healthcare quite yet. We're hopefully moving in that direction and that's um, a benefit of simulation is to help practice those skills in a safe setting so that when you have it in real life and you have that experience, you know exactly what to do. You've built the muscle memory, you have the cognitive skills and the teamwork, leadership, role dynamics to help you uh, perform optimally in a crisis. The important crisis resource management or crew resource management techniques that aviation and aerospace industry utilize are communication, leadership, delegation of tasks, monitoring, cross-checking, avoidance of preoccupation. Those are their, their really key skills that they focus on. How many of those overlap with what we do? Quite a few. An example of crisis resource management in action, does anybody recognize this photo? This was what they termed the miracle on the Hudson River. <coughs> this was the Hudson River landing in New York in 2009. 155 passengers and crew took off from LaGuardia Airport in New York. As soon as they took off, they hit a flock of geese and they lost both engines. And they had to do what's called an unpowered emergency landing. The captain of this um, aircraft was basically a hero in the U.S. at the time and he was all over the news because none of the passengers or crew died. You can see them all on the wings down there. Um, to talk to him and listen to reports from him, he said it was a lot of luck. I would agree with some of that. It was probably lucky that he was on board because he had about 35 years, I think it was, of simulation and uh, safety training under his belt. So he had um, he had that safety component, but even more so, he had experienced this in a simulator. This is something that they would have simulated time and time again. It's a, it's a major crisis for an airline pilot. And so when it happened, they knew exactly what to do because they had to practice it many times. Uh, and that's what the simulation uh, environment can do for you. It can help you to prepare for real crises. Yes. Crisis resource management in healthcare. So because it's gone from aviation and aerospace, um, they've noticed that those key resources, those crew resource management techniques that have been so important in aviation are important to healthcare as well. So in the late, late 1980s and uh, early 90s, an anesthesiologist, a few in Stanford, adapted these principles to healthcare and they've dubbed them crisis resource management skills. Because we know in healthcare, it looks a lot like this picture. It's fast moving, it's dynamic, it's changing, it's complex. Crisis resource management in healthcare, as far as simulation goes, it helps to develop those behavioral skills, the leadership, communication, teamwork, um, and it helps to promote the safety and prevent errors by practicing. Just through the simple act of practicing can help with safety. Recognizing these key behavioral skills in in each other and in ourselves is really important going forward as well. 
And if you do simulation within a hospital setting or within your normal healthcare setting, which a lot of you do, you can uncover systems errors. So those latent errors that would go undetected but are found through the use of simulation in your practice area. So what are these crisis resource management skills that we're going to talk about? So the first one, know your environment, anticipate and plan, call for help early, leadership, allocate attention and utilize information, distribute the workload and utilize resources, effective communication. So we'll go through these one by one. Know your environment. So what does this mean to you, knowing your environment? Mm -hmm. So knowing where your equipment is and goes beyond that as well. Knowing where hazards would be. Mm -hmm. Yep, where hazards are. Knowing how to use your equipment. So again, it, it's about having the equipment available, but if you don't know how to use it, that's a problem. Possibly who's on shift that day that should you need them, who's capable of doing what. Mm, exactly. And that gets to that point, what does it mean for your colleagues? So you know what it means for you. Maybe you know where all your supplies are. You've worked in the unit for 20 years. Um, and maybe you help train people where supplies are. You know. uh, but what does it mean for agency workers, for instance, who come in, float to your uh, unit? So not being aware of the intrusive processes as well, like how do you get x-ray to come to you, how do you get blood up from you? Know, yeah. Processes and policies, yeah, that you take for granted when you know them, but when you don't know them, that's a real problem for patient care. How can you get to know your environment better? Practice, yeah. How many of your hospitals utilize orientations when you have new employees come through? Kind of, tre you guys use the treasure hunts? Yeah. But Holly mentioned it as well. It's about knowing the hazards, looking at the hazards, finding the hazards, but then remedying, taking the time and extra steps to remedy those hazards so that they don't impact the rest of us. Um, it's about safety in your environment as well. So safety for the patient, but also safety for all staff members. Anticipate and plan. So thinking ahead on the patient, side of things as well as equipment. So it's knowing what's happening with your patient now, but what's going to happen two, three, four steps down the road and anticipating what equipment you're going to need and what help you're going to need for this patient. The second one is discipline creates performance. That's about not taking shortcuts. So if you create the discipline to create to check your safety equipment, for example, every time, you're creating the standard and in case you need to perform it, AKA use that, you will be able to because you've created that discipline within yourself to do that double checking. Do we plan for unanticipated events very well in healthcare? Should do. Should do. Not unanticipated, no. Maybe anticipated if you've got somebody who's poorly, but somebody who's slapped up fit and well, possibly not. Yeah, it's, it's something that we could uh, improve on. It's something that the aviation and aerospace industry do quite a bit and we can take from them. Uh, what about failure? What about safety? How good are we? I mean, if we take a really close look, do we plan for failure? Do we have contingency plans that we use? Or is it a, more of a reactive environment? Are we proactive or are we reactive? Generally, we're a reactive culture. So those are things to think about in, in anticipation and planning and having a discussion with your trainees. Calling for help early. So again, we have this mentality that we as healthcare professionals need to do it all and we need to do it perfectly. And what does that do for us when we're trying to call for help? It delays us calling for help because we think we should do it all and we should do it perfectly. We shouldn't need anybody else. So we tend to not call for help as quickly as we should. We see that a lot in simulation, um, that people will go into the scenario, they'll have that mentality, they'll also have what we call fixation error, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, and they may actually forget 
to call for help. Even if we've told them that there's help available to you, they're waiting in the wings, so to speak, that is something that we notice a lot in simulation. So it's practicing how to call for help and getting the right people into the room. What determines the need to call for help? Why have you called for help in your practice? To support. Support? Yeah. Yep. Anticipate something's going to happen. So you have an anticipation that something's going to happen, maybe a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. As healthcare providers, we have kind of this, this gut that we follow a lot. Changes in patient condition. Changes in patient condition, definitely. It's that feeling. A lot of it is a feeling on why we need to call for help. But there's also another aspect. Um, maybe we can't do it all. So you want to think about when you're calling for help, what help do you need? There's two categories usually. So we talk a lot about brains versus hands. Do you have a cognitive issue? You're just not quite sure clinically what's going on with this patient. You need to get a second opinion. You need to get some other people in the room to help you um, with the thought process of how am I going to treat this patient? What, what do I need to do for this patient? Or do you need physically more people in the room? Do you need more hands? Are you starting to do resuscitation care and you need to um, do chest compressions? You need to bag the patient and you actually physically need more people. So think about that when you're actually calling for help, what you need so you can be very clear and concise. Because that's the other thing that aviation has a real handle on. If you listen to transcripts um, of the communication of that um, miracle on the Hudson River, the whole incident from landing or from takeoff to landing took about three minutes. They had three minutes to save 155 lives. And they did a good job because the communication with the ground control was very concise. That helps. If you're not giving a ton of information that people have to wade through and pick out the key pieces. And we, we do that with ISOBAR. How many of you use ISOBAR? That's pretty much the standard. Is there any other communication? Sure. What's it? Share. Sure. Share. Sure. Sure. Yeah. We used to use the acid bar, which was called a shed. Okay. Yeah, so there's some communication um, pathways that we use already to help us. They're designed to help us give that concise information, to wade through all the superfluous information and just get to the key, key points. The other thing I always talk about in this section is to be a good colleague. So how many of us have been called to a situation and then not been needed because there's a ton of people in the room. Has that happened to all of us? Mm -hmm. So what happens if we get angry? Oh gosh, I was pulled away from what I needed to do and came here, they didn't even need me. Is that helpful? It may make you a little bit slow the next time. Kind of thing. Yeah. So we have to remember that sometimes you're going to get called to help and you don't need it. They don't need you. Somebody else has come. So just be a good colleague. Say, okay, no worries, come back you know, when you need me next time. Um, don't take that on as a personal affront that, gosh, they pulled me away from what I was doing and now you know, they don't need me. The other thing that we talk about in being a good colleague is when you come into a crisis, oftentimes it's chaotic. So the best thing that you can do is try to, one, locate a leader, go to that leader and state your name and what your role is. That will give the leader an understanding of what capabilities they can put you in. If you come into a crisis and there's no leader, you cannot identify anybody that's in charge of the situation, the best thing for you to do is to go and take a task over from someone else that you feel comfortable with. So chest compressions are going. Go ahead, go in the room, take over the chest compressions. The person's doing the chest compressions but in the room a lot longer than you have they can now have the mental capacity to actually tell you what's going on with the patient and you can suss out those details and then do you know swap overs as needed. So the best thing to do if there's no leader in the room is to go in there and take over a task that you can physically do and that you're capable of doing so that relieves the mental strain on someone else. So how hard is it to do um, two tasks at once? If you're trying to do chest compressions and you're trying to um, coordinate with the bagging, the person that's bagging, and you're trying to give a handover. How hard is that? It's pretty hard. We can do one thing pretty well. Two things, maybe, not so much. Three things, forget about it. We just, we just can't. We're humans. We cannot do that. Leadership. 
Ensure leadership and role clarity. So what are good actions of a leader? Calm. Calm. Definitely. Good communication. Good communication. Huge. Directive. Directive. Assertive. Yep. Shares the mental model. You will stand back and direct and let others get on with it kind of thing rather than want to do everything. Right. And that, that actually gets to the second point. Can you tell who a leader is when you come into a room? Delegating. Person delegating? Mm -hmm. Any other? Sometimes some ED departments now have the vests on to identify mm -hmm. people, don't they? I've seen yeah, that's a really great idea. Yeah. Generally, a leader, if they're being an appropriate leader, they are away from the patient. Mm -hmm. They have stepped away from the bed, they are directing traffic, but they are not doing any interventions on the patient. They have no hands on the patient. What determines or who determines a changeover in leadership? Skill set. Skill set, so maybe some, uh, with a, someone with a greater expertise comes into the room. So that might, yep. Exhaustion, tiredness. Yep, fatigue. It gets back to what we were just talking about. It's called task saturation. So if someone is bagging the patient and they're trying to be the leader, how effective are they? Not super effective. Um, because you're trying to do something that takes a mental load as well as a, a physical load and it's quite hard to do. So if the leader has found himself or herself in a position where they're doing two things at once and they're task saturated, uh, that determines a changeover. Can anybody be a leader? Yeah. yeah. And that's what we, we talk a lot about in simulation as well. Is anybody can be a leader. It doesn't matter your position. Um, there's been an example that has come through the center of a um, equipment issue. There was a person in, uh, getting an operation. There was an uh, issue with the equipment, and it was uh, very hard to actually move the patient because of where the equipment was located in proximity to the patient. And everybody in the whole room, all of the healthcare providers were very stressed out. How are we going to solve this problem? You know who solved the problem? The housekeeper who was watching from afar. Said, oh, well, you might as well just put this down, you know, pull the bed down and then you can move it out here. But everyone was so fixated on the problem, they couldn't see the solutions. So everyone has a valuable point. It doesn't matter your role. The other thing that I talk about here is the crisis resource management tagline um, that we've gleaned from American Airlines. And I kind of quite like it. It's authority with participation, assertiveness with respect. So it sums up what a leader should do. So they should have a position of authority, but they should participate. They should be getting information from the rest of the team. They should have that respect for the rest of the team. They should be asking other people's points of view. Um, but they do have to make decisions and be assertive. So it's those characteristics that are, are really um, important for leadership. Attention and information. Allocate attention appropriately and ut utilize all available information. So this also gets back to the leadership. Um, a lot of these crisis resource management techniques do have some overlap. Um, yourself, if you're leading, you need to ask yourself, should you be leading? Am I the best person for this job? It's all about putting the right person in the right job. Think about all the things that we have to pay attention to. Uh, patients, monitors, medications, labs, scans, test results, family, coworkers. Anything else that we have to think about that draws our attention? Because attention is a limited resource. Our brains make attention a limited resource. So we have to keep that in mind. There's a lot of things coming in that we have to then filter and then make use of. Reevaluate, reevaluate, reevaluate. Always have to take in the information, reevaluate its usefulness, take it on board, and then utilize it appropriately. Other thing I always mention here is go back to the patient. So we have a lot of technology now. It's only increasing. The sounds in the patient care rooms are increasing. The monitors that we have to look at are increasing. Um, the most important thing for your attention when all else fails is to go back to the patient. That's going to be your best resource. 
And we sometimes forget that when we're in, in the mix of chaos. Workload and resource. So distribute the workload and utilize all available resources. Again, this is a bit of monitoring and scanning the situation, prioritizing, recruiting help as needed, assigning tasks, and then redoing it again. Every time somebody comes into the team as a new player, you have to make sure that the right person is in the right role. And so you need to monitor, scan, recruit more help, prioritize, change things around. Because our resources, we have personnel, we have equipment, cognitive aids, checklists, policies, all of that has to be integrated in the work we do. And the biggie, communication. So effective communication. What are features of effective communication? Two-way understanding. Two-way understanding. So the closed loop communication are you referring to? Yeah, so does anyone know what closed loop communication is? Directly at somebody rather than shouting it out, hoping somebody will do that task. Yeah, so Back that's part of it. Yep, so it's making a communication pathway between two or more people, so direct communication between um, two or more. Um, but it's also feeding back the information. So it's closing the loop. Um, you know, Holly, can you get one milligram of adrenaline? And then you would repeat back, I'm going to get one milligram of adrenaline. Um, and then when you go get it, again, repeating that closed loop and saying, I have it now, do you want me to give it? And then, you know, it's, it's about closing the communication loop so that everybody's on the same page. Um, open air command. So an example of an open air command is basically saying, I need help in here. Just saying it out loud to what we call the air. Or can somebody get the crash trolley? Well, unless you direct it at someone, you're probably not going to get it as timely as you would if you had, you know, said so-and-so get it. Yeah, and exactly. And multiple people might go get it. Or maybe nobody will go get it because nobody heard it because they're all fixated on what they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> communication obviously should be an info exchange. So again, we've heard this. It's a reoccurring theme. Everyone has a perspective. And we should tap into that. Of course, we need to be uh, professional, so we need to resolve conflict quickly. It's always about the patient. You can resolve any kind of interpersonal staff issues offline, on the side. Focusing on the patient um, is obviously optimal. And then keeping the volume low. So in crises, the volume in the room and the monitors and everything coming, going, machines getting moved, all of that is quite loud, and so obviously you need to get information across, but you also want to keep the volume in the room quite low. We find that in simulation throughout the course of the day, because we often run one-day programs. The volume in the first one or two scenarios is really, really loud. As people kind of find their way, kind of natural leaders come out, and then at the end of the day, it's like clockwork. Just an eight-hour period is so impactful in actual training. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, the, the, the quietness in the room um, and the teamwork at the end of the day is really, really powerful. Human factors errors. So a few discussion points on human factors errors. We've got loss of situational awareness. Does anyone know what situational awareness is? Your surroundings being aware of them. Yeah, so it's knowing about what's happening with your patient now and again, what could happen down the road. Loss of shared mental model. What's a shared mental model? Same mindset, same direction, confidence and capability. Yeah, so it's, it's knowing about what's happening with your patient now, but making sure the whole team has the same viewpoint. Um, fixation error. How about a fixation error? We've talked a little bit about it. Trying to fix something and getting fixated on that instead of moving on and getting some help or being the one, you know, trying to losing time or instead of moving on and letting go and let somebody else either get involved or support you. Yeah, exactly. It it off, fixation errors often happen around equipment issues, 
uh, because we, we want this equipment to work. We know it should work this way, but for some reason it's just not working. And so you get so focused on that, you almost get this tunnel vision that you can't see any other solutions outside of your, your tunnel. Um, and you can't see anybody that's coming to the room that might be able to help you because you are literally so focused. So sometimes fixation error is really important. If you're doing a task, you know, intubating the patient, you want to be very fixated and focused on what you're doing for that short amount of time. But as a general sense, fixation errors in general aren't, aren't very helpful. Um, and it can't, it's not just um, equipment issues. We can also have fixation errors clinically. So maybe we think, oh, it's definitely this situation. This patient's, this is what's going to happen to this patient. And it, it may not be. So we get fixated on the fact that it's one thing when it might not be. How do we overcome these human factors errors? Practice. The big way to come overcome fixation errors is by communication. So thinking out loud, talking out loud, um, saying, hey, I have, I'm having trouble with this. Can you look at this? That saves a lot of time. It's hard for us to do because we have that mentality that, gosh, I should be able to figure this out. Uh, it's worked for me before. Um, but it, it's about getting the perspective from everyone, talking about it, taking that few seconds, you know, 30 seconds. This is what I'm seeing. Is everybody seeing that as well? We don't do that enough in healthcare, and it's, it's really important. That little bit of time used there can save you a lot of time down the road. I'm going to hop out of this talk, I'm almost done here, and I'm going to show a quick video called Monkey Business Illusion, which is um, widely available on YouTube, on the internet, and you have the link here. Um, it's about two minutes. Some of you may have seen it, but it does highlight some of the key issues we've just been talking about. Let's see. Who's seen this video? Anybody? Just one person in the room has seen it? Might have seen it once, once it starts. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's, again, two minutes, so I'm just going to let this play. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wear and what pass the ball. Okay. Anybody want to be brave enough to? 14. 14? 14? 14? 15? 10. 10. Okay, that's, they're going to tell you the answer. The correct answer is 16 passes. Okay. Okay. Did you spot the gorilla? <laughs> Did some people see the gorilla? No. It's okay no. if you didn't. Okay, so for the people that saw the gorilla, or even anybody actually, anybody see a person leaving the game or the curtain change? Okay. Let's rewind and watch it again. <laughs> Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. So that's a cute video that we often show as it highlights some of these human factors issues. <coughs> so obviously we've been given a task to count the number of passes uh, of the ball and so we're fixated because that is the task that we've been given. So sometimes when we're fixated and we have that fixation, we can't see anything else around. So we don't see the gorilla, we don't see the curtain change, we don't see the player leaving the game. 
And even if you've seen the video and you know that the gorilla is coming, you may not, you're focused on the gorilla now and not the basketballs. Now you're focused on seeing the gorilla because I know it's there, but you miss the other things. So it's really kind of cute, but impactful video because it, it talks about situational awareness. You know, what are we seeing in the video and, and what is everybody else seeing? Are we on the same shared mental model? We talk about it in relationship to teamwork because when you talk about, when you stop the video and say how many passes, we get a wide variety of responses. The same when we talk about the gorilla. We, some people have seen it, some people didn't. Some people saw the curtain change, some people saw the player leaving. So individually, probably nobody in the room counted the passes right, saw the gorilla, saw the curtain change, and saw the player leaving. But collectively, if we came together, we get all of those things. We see the bigger picture. So it's kind of a cute video to show, to, to identify that. I've gone over my time, as I usually do with this discussion, because I think it's so important to actually set the groundwork for what you're hoping to achieve during your simulations. And we really do focus more on the behavioral component of things. And so that's why we spend all that time talking about the crisis resource management skills, and we have it posted in our debriefing rooms because it's such a valuable point. Um, most of the trainees that come through here uh, are healthcare providers already licensed and so we're not focused on putting in the IV or, or the technical cognitive skills that we anticipate they already have. We're focusing on the crises management skills that break down during crisis. Um, any questions on that so far? Has it been identified as what? Uh, is there like a time? <coughs> oh, uh, shit. Most effective and stuff, or is it just depending on how complex the, the room, it's the simulation room, it's It depends on your learners. So everything we do in simulation <coughs> goes back to the level of the participants or the learners. Um, so if these people have never, ever done simulation before, and I usually take a, a tally, like who's been in simulation before, oftentimes we have a good majority have gone through simulation before, so they kind of know the drill. You know, sometimes there's somebody that has never done it before, or they've done a very, very low fidelity simulation. So you have to spend a bit more time, especially you know working with students. You're going to have to spend that time up front. A lot of us doing um, simulation in the hospital and you know mock codes, for instance, it's hard to actually do that familiarization. Um, but there's got to be a way to actually provide that information for them so that they can go in and do the learning and it's not about the technology because we really want to focus on the methodology, not the technology. Um, so a way to get around that if you're doing it in hospital is to maybe create a video that staff have to watch, watch as part of their training, um, which could be a room familiarization of the mannequins that you use and so that, you know, as adult learners, we help hold people accountable for you know, coming prepared, hopefully. And so that could be a way to get around the time issue. Uh, but generally, you need to spend the time to do the familiarization appropriately. We spend, depending on the number of mannequins um, and the amount of clinical time, hands-on time you want the participants to have, it's about 20 to 30 minutes or so. Uh, yeah, so probably about, the, the guy that I've given you has said they can do theirs in about 15 minutes, and they cover a lot of things. Um, so it's probably 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the number of scenarios, the level of the learners, um, and what your objectives for the course are. So if you've got a lot of clinical stuff in there, then you know tasks that they're going to have to do built into the scenarios, you're going to need to let them have some time doing that. So it would be you know maybe 30, 30 minutes per mannequin, I would think. Um, 